yesterday's prophecies for today's world. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer and he is in you and you need not be afraid. And now, Hal Lindsey's Bible study of the book of John. All of Jesus' life, he was aware of God's timetable. You know that? He talked about it a lot. My hour has not yet come. He knew God's whole timetable for his life. He operated by it. And uh, he was continually conscious that his, his destiny was set. And uh, you know something? Since I was a young Christian, there is a verse that God put in my mind that uh, when I get in a life-threatening situation or I get in a very, very dangerous situation, without thinking, without trying to recall anything, the Holy Spirit puts those words on my lips. And it's from Psalm 31, verse 15. The start of that verse says this, My times are in your hands. And then, when the Holy Spirit puts that on my heart, I change from fear to courage. Because I know my times are in God's hands. I know nothing or anyone can kill me until God's time. And if it's God's time, I'm ready. I don't want to stick around a second after God's time for me is finished. And so, he says, this is when his mother had not recognized her place after Jesus had started his father's ministry. She was used to instant and uh, complete obedience as a good mother and son relationship. But Jesus was telling her that relationship is now changed. So in John chapter 2, uh, verse 3, it says, When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus' response, Jesus said to her, not woman, but lady. It would be softer than that. He would say, lady, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. In other words, the time when she could pray to him or when he could uh, have a relationship that uh, would be in another realm that hour had not yet come. So he began to talk about the hour. And John talks about that more than anybody else. All right, let's look at uh, chapter 4, verse 21. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. See, he was talking about what he was going to establish. The hour was not here yet, but the hour is coming when that would be done. Of course, he would have to die and be resurrected to, to make it effective, all right? Now, chapter 5, verse 25. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear shall live. He was saying that the hour was coming that would uh, pay for this, but, not, but even now God had already authorized him to raise the dead. Now, 
Look at chapter uh, 7, verse 30. They were seeking, therefore, to seize him, and no man laid his hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. See what I mean about courage? When you rest in the fact that your times are in God's hand, you don't have to fear. One Christian and God is a majority in any situation. Look at chapter 8, verse 20. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no, no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Now look at chapter 12, verse 23. And Jesus answers them in saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Finally, he knew it was the hour of destiny for him. The hour of decision that would change the destiny of the universe. And we're introduced to something here. That is just amazing. When does this happen? Well, it happens right after verse 26, where it says, Now there were certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These therefore came to Philip, who was from Bethesda of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip came and they told Jesus. And that's when he said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. You see, there are two things in juxtaposition here in this context. First, there's the absolute rejection of God's greatest prophetic sign by the, by the Israelite leadership that he was the Messiah. They rejected him. And then right after that, the Greeks, which was simply a word in the New Testament for Gentiles, those of the Greek uh, culture is what it's talking about. Uh, they, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Well, he knew that he couldn't do anything for them until he went to the cross and died for their sins and was raised from the dead. But as soon as they were seeking him out, John makes a big point of that, that he says this. And then we're introduced into something that had me in tears this afternoon as I was reading it and studying it in the original Greek. Jesus reveals a conflict that had been going on inside of him and growing and growing. He says in verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. This is the spiritual law of multiplication. To bear fruit, you have to die. And it's even shown in nature. A seed has to be put in the ground and die before it bears fruit. And... Uh, Jesus knew that that was God's plan for him. That's why he said the hours come. It's interesting that he called going to suffer the horrible things that he was going to suffer on a cross. He called that being glorified. We'll look at that in a minute. And then he says, and I'm going to give you a literal interpretation of the Greek of verse 25 because it is so important. The one who habitually loves his soulish life that's what it says in the Greek. The word love by the way is not agape it's philo Philo is the word 
it, it's the kind of word that would be the highest of, that could be done by humans without the Holy Spirit. It is the, but is the kind of word that's associated with uh, human passion, the highest human passion. And so what he is emphasizing here is not using agape deliberately. He is saying uh, the one who habitually is clinging to or, 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 or attached to is the best way it would be understood here, who is habitually attached to his life. And the word for life is the word suke, which is soul. And the soul stands for human life, not pneuma, which is spiritual life, or zoe, which is the highest form of spiritual life. It is the word suke, and that's used very carefully here. So what this would translate, should be understood as, is that the one who habitually clings to his soulish life shall lose it. And the one who habitually, it's the same word, the one who habitually hates, this is an intensive word, the one who habitually hates his life in this world system, it's the word of cosmos, who runs and sets up the world system? Satan, it says, he's the prince of, the, of this world. And uh, he's the one who has set up all of the, what's the end thing? What's the, what's the, uh, what's going to be the, uh, the most passionate things of the culture and so forth? He sets all of these things up. So he's saying the one who, who habitually hates his life or the, his human life in this world system, shall preserve his life for the purpose of eternity. Now this is absolutely the way it says it in the Greek. The word uh, the word that's translated here keep this world shall keep. It's the word philoso which means to uh, to preserve something. It's the idea of preserving something. And so he says, the one who habitually hates his life, his, his fleshly or, or human life in this world system, shall preserve his life. And then it's the word ice, which means for the purpose of. He shall preserve his life for the purpose of eternity. Now here, breaking it down is this. This is a spiritual law. If, if you are habitually attached to the things of this world system, you're going to lose the significance of your life. You'll get into heaven, but you're going to smell like smoke. Because remember, salvation is determined by what? Faith in Christ as your Savior. But the one who, and we're talking not about individual acts. This is, the word is in the, it's a preposition in the present tense, which means something habitual. So the one who habitually, hate doesn't mean you always hate it, but you have, as a habit, you hate the things of this life in the world system. What you're doing is preserving the things in your life for eternity. In other words, you're going to be rewarded for it. You're going to enjoy what you have earned with your life for eternity. You're saving for eternity. And that's what he is trying to emphasize here. And then he says... If anyone, verse 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall my servants also be. If anyone serves me, and that if is third class condition, 
which means maybe you will, maybe you won't. In other words, you have free will here. If anyone serves me, and you have a choice, the Father will honor him. This is where I began to choke up. Verse 27. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Now, here is what Jesus was going through an inner conflict that his disciples were not aware of. And the word that's translated here, wrestles, or uh, he was, uh, as it says here, my soul has become troubled. This is the word tarasso, T-A-R-A-S-S-O. And it means, its root meaning is to violently shake and stir a body of water. So it means something that is really uh, violently shaking up water. Now, when it is used with a human emotion, it means for a person's soul to be so disturbed by events that are about to happen, that he is thrown into overwhelming emotional distress. Art and Gingrich, the greatest authorities on the Greek language that we have available today, translate it that way. And the word terrasso is in the perfect tense, which means this is something that began to happen in the past. With the results, it continues and apparently it has grown in intensity for him. When he finally says the hour has come, he is, he is being shaken to his very soul. Now, you see, this shows the true humanity of Jesus. He wasn't just marching to the cross ignorantly, because as we'll see in chapter 13, verse 1, he knew everything that was going to come upon him. He was aware. In his divine nature, he had the omniscience, which, which he was allowed to use, even under submission as a man. Now, it's also in the passive voice. What does a passive voice mean? It means the subject receives the action of the verb, right? Okay. So this means that this intense shaking and stirring of his soul was coming from another source. Now, who would that be? Satan. So he was undergoing tremendous shaking and stirring of his soul. And how does he survive it? He refocuses on his life purpose. In the midst of this agony going on inside, what does he say? Father, glorify your name. That's why he came. To glorify his name meant for him to go in obedience to the cross and die for the sins of mankind. And that would show the angelic realm the depths of God's love in his character and also the depths of his devotion to true justice and true righteousness. He didn't bend his character to achieve what he wanted to do. But in love, he was willing to pay his own laws of justice in order that he might save mankind. And that, when it talks about glorify your name, you see God's name is his character. Now, 
When he said, Father, glorify your name, there came therefore a voice out of heaven. I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Now let me tell you what that really means in context. You see, this was God the Father responding to his Son. And when he says, I have glorified my name in you, and I will glorify it again. This was the, the Father speaking to the Son, and, and in a sense saying, I'm so proud of you. You've glorified my name from the moment you stepped into a human person and became a man. Every moment of the, every day that you've been on earth, you have been in full submission to me and you have glorified my name with every breath. And he says, and I will glorify it again. And so it says, verse 29, The multitude therefore who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered, or others were saying an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered and, uh, and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for yours. Now the judgment upon this world system, now is the ruler of this world system, being cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. We have no idea of how much Jesus suffered on our behalf. We can't know that. We just know that it was beyond anything that we could imagine. But here he was, his soul just torn apart inside. Because he wasn't just going to physical death. He knew that he and a, a holy person, his deity, a holy being that had never been in contact with sin, was about to have the sin of every person who would ever live put on him and you can't imagine just the emotional impact of such an invasion of purity that our deeds would have just look at the television news for one day and you see what kind of horrible things he had to pay for But he faced it. And when he came to it, he, he said, Now my hour has come. And shall I say, Father, deliver me from this hour? But it was for this hour that I came. So he was wrestling. See, as a man, he had to go through all of the human emotions and human mental, mental uh, processes of knowing everything that was coming and making a full, knowledgeable decision to do it. And part of that was so intense he sweat blood when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. But that was a build-up. I mean, this pressure had been going on before that. But he never said anything until here. What a Savior we have. How much we should love him. I tell you, I just want to, there's some questions I want to ask. But I wouldn't be able to bear the answer until I get there. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for our great Savior, Jesus. I thank you that when the people you had, you had covenanted with rejected you and the 
lost, without hope Gentiles asked we would see Jesus, that he immediately turned to his task of saving the world and saving us. We thank you that for all eternity we'll be able to sing praises to this one who has purchased us out of eternal destruction and loss and given us eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. But when you really get a grip on the fact that Jesus so saves you when you simply admit your sins and receive the gift of pardon, that you are already in heaven as far as he's concerned. As I prepared for this week's program, I was again struck by the speed with which events are moving into the scenario the prophets predicted for the end times. I believe we're there. People on the street are talking about what all of these things mean. Folks that wouldn't darken the door of a church or pick up a, a Bible are now very curious. This may be our greatest opportunity, maybe even our last opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ before we're silenced by political correctness. The message that God has given me is more important now than it's ever been for the church and for the nation. That's why I'm asking you to help me to expand our reach. You can find more of Hal Lindsey at his website, www.howlindsey.com. There you can access our video and article archives. Visit our online store for Hal Lindsey CDs, books, and other specialty items. Hal Lindsey's comprehensive teaching on the Gospel of John is now available as an audio book. This incredible teaching will enrich your personal study of the book of John and enhance your understanding of the nature and character of Jesus Christ. The Late Great Planet Earth is a timeless examination of the Bible prophecies about the end of this age. When it was published, it caused a worldwide sensation. Now, you can own the Home Study Guide for the Late Great Planet Earth. It provides valuable assistance for the study and discussion of both the book and the Bible, suggested scriptures to study, helpful questions, relevant remarks, and vivid illustrations will help you better understand this world-changing book. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to How Lindsay Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit howlindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.